Hi, I'm Leone from Spines and Splines, and today I'm going to do something a little bit different, but somebody asked about it and I thought it might be a fun video to make, and that is to give you a small tour of the room in my house where I make my art and my music and my videos. We currently rent a house in Ireland, and this bedroom measures three and a half by two and a half meters. There's not a lot that I can do to physically change it because we rent, and it's pretty small and I've got to fit a lot of stuff in it. So this might not be as aesthetically pleasing as some of the studio tours that you see on YouTube, but it might be interesting if you're trying to figure out how to start a YouTube channel or how to make videos with not very much money and not very much space. If you want to skip to certain parts of the video, there'll be links in the description where you can do that. Let's go. When we lived in Dublin, I rented a studio space from a fantastic artist group called Mart, but I had to leave that studio when we moved to Cork. We looked specifically for unfurnished houses that had an extra room I could use. Good affordable rental houses are pretty thin on the ground here and finding an unfurnished house is almost impossible. We live in a three storey house, but infuriatingly, because it's three storeys, half the house is taken up by a staircase. So there's not a lot of actual space in the rooms and there is almost no storage space. Because of that, I've had to put up some shelves on the walls for storing lighter weight things and I use this couch, which is also our spare bed, for storing my large packs of paper. I had to do a little modification to the couch storage section to support the weight of the paper, but that was pretty easy. The space behind my printing press is kind of a nightmare zone. It might look like a pile of rubbish, but the old sock is to protect my mic from dust when I'm not using it and the shoe boxes store things and help elevate my computer, iPad or other equipment if I need to when I'm shooting. I keep more things that I don't have to use a lot in big plastic tubs under my etching press and supplies that I use more often in the set of shelves by my window. Basically, the room is set up following a hierarchy of things that I need to use a lot, things that I use sometimes and things that are very important once or twice a year. I used to make one video at a time, but the size of this room has made everything much more difficult, so I've started planning videos more carefully and try to film several at once over a couple of days. That way I only have to set everything up once and clean up once or twice. I spend a lot more time in pre-production now, but putting that extra planning time in has also been beneficial in other ways. Speaking of planning, one of the best things I ever bought was this set of plan drawers. I found them for $150 in Australia about 12 years ago, and even though they're incredibly heavy and difficult to move, they've travelled over 18,000 kilometres with me since. When I moved from Australia, the base of my big desk was the one thing that broke, and so I bought some short hairpin legs and made it into a standing desk on top of the drawers. I keep a lot of random stuff under there like my scanner, paint brushes, old phone books for printing, some tubs of packing materials and these slide out IKEA tubs where I keep art supplies that get used a lot, like my watercolours, pencils, bookbinding stuff and printmaking tools. The bigger tub has microphones, audio gear and small instruments that I use for video music production and songwriting. I've always been pretty interested in music, but audio production was the thing that I knew the least about when I started making videos. Either fortunately or unfortunately, there's no time limit on YouTube art tutorials, so people still watch my old videos and still constantly complain about the audio production. Once you've uploaded a video to YouTube, the audio can't be replaced without deleting and re-uploading the whole video, so please, please, if you want to let somebody know that the audio isn't great, check how old the video is first and maybe read through some of the comments to see if anybody else has already said it. In my first videos, I didn't want to worry about copyright, so I used a handful of songs that my husband wrote about 20 years ago. I tried using royalty-free classical tracks once or twice, but even then I had to deal with copyright claims from music licensing bots, so I decided to try making my own. I've still got a lot to learn, and sometimes I still accidentally make the music too loud because mixing is hard and ears get tired, but now I record and produce all my own music for videos and I really enjoy doing it. On top of my desk, I keep this IKEA stool that I used to use as an actual stool, but now use as an extra set of shelves. 
I've modded it so that I can hang my screen printing squeegees and printmaking rollers so they don't get damaged. The power points in my studio are down behind the desk, so I've plugged in a power board that has mounting points and hung it in the best spot for me to easily access. Beside my desk I keep this big office printer that we bought secondhand, and I keep some other random stuff like sketchbooks, some art supplies and a guitar stand. Usually my electric guitar lives there, but this weekend I've been practicing and recording bass. One of my hopes and dreams when I have a bigger space to work in is to get some proper filming lights set up. Lighting is probably my most difficult hurdle, especially in winter here when it gets very dark for most of the day. I just don't have the space or the money to invest in good lights currently though, so I make do with a window to my left and this incredibly cheap IKEA floor lamp that has an up light and a second light on a gooseneck. It's far from ideal, but it's what I've got to work with for now. Now on to all the technical bits. If you're wondering what the best camera for shooting video is, it's the camera that you already have. If all you've got is a phone camera, start shooting video on that and see if you enjoy it. You might decide down the track to upgrade, but you don't have to buy something new when you're just starting. I'd recommend getting some sort of small tripod to hold your phone camera. I bought this one from a shopping centre stall years before I started making videos, but I would probably recommend one of those little gorilla tripods that you can wrap around things. My phone isn't my primary camera, but I do still use it from time to time to get shots that are difficult with my DSLR. Including this shot of my DSLR. This is a Canon 80D DSLR camera. This model is discontinued, but even now it's still pretty expensive secondhand. We bought our first DSLR in about 2004 and have upgraded the body twice, but kept the same lenses. I love this camera because I can shoot in full manual mode and I can manually set my focus on what I need to and I can compensate pretty well for my terrible lighting situation that way. The camera body has a little flip out screen that I can use when I need to. If I'm filming myself I shut that screen, it only opens out to the side and the natural instinct is to look into that instead of the camera lens and if you do that it looks like you're looking away off screen. For video, I mostly use two prime lenses. The first is a 24mm pancake lens, which I use for most of my video. It gets a pretty wide shot, it lets in a good amount of light, and it's very lightweight and takes up almost no space. I use a 50mm lens when I want to get a closer, more detailed shot, or if I'm shooting an artwork and specifically don't want any lens distortion. I do have other lenses that I use occasionally, but these are my go-to lenses. If you choose a DSLR for video in any brand, you'll be able to find equivalent lenses. My tripod is one that I bought for about $20 over 20 years ago. I've been meaning to upgrade it since then and I just never have. It's pretty lightweight, which is both a blessing and a curse. I can make it tall or short depending on what I need, but it moves very easily if you accidentally knock it, and I have to edit out the start and the end of each video when I press the camera button. But because it's light, it's also very easy to move around my room. Ideally, I'd like a magic arm system that I can mount to my desk or to a roof in the house that I own, but I still need to shoot at both my desk and my press, and having a movable tripod is a good inexpensive way to do that easily. One of my favourite acquisitions in the past six months was my husband giving me his old iPad and Apple Pencil when he bought a new one. It turns out that using the Procreate drawing program on the iPad is a really great, easy way to make fun titles and illustrations that I can use to add a bit of panache to my videos. I've been really trying to step up my production levels in the past year and getting this iPad has been a huge win for that. I write titles and do drawings on lots of separate layers in Procreate then I export those as transparent PNG files and animate them in my editing program. Side note, since getting this, I've made a bunch of paper texture brushes for Procreate, and if you'd like to buy them, you can follow the link to my website in the video description. You'll also find links in the description to many other places where you can support me online, including Patreon, 
So many thanks to my Patreon subscribers, and if you'd like to join them, follow the links in the description. Now onto computers and editing software. I edit all my videos on a Mac laptop. I used to use an old second-hand iMac, but editing video can take up a lot of CPU power and it was incredibly slow on that machine. I upgraded to a second-hand Mac laptop for a while, then finally bought a new computer for the first time in a million years when Apple released the MacBook Air with an M1 chip in 2021. This laptop is incredibly fast and it's super quiet because it's got no fan, and it's really great for music and video production. I have a subscription to Adobe Creative Cloud, which I've had for many years for design work, and I use Premiere Pro from that subscription to edit all my videos. I find it really intuitive to use and especially useful for colour correction, which is important to me considering the previously mentioned terrible lighting situation in my studio. If you don't have an Adobe subscription and you don't want one, there are a bunch of free or low-cost video editing programs that you can use. iMovie comes free with Mac computers, so you could use that. One that I haven't tried but I see a lot of people recommending is DaVinci Resolve, so I'll include a link to that in the description as well. How you edit your videos will depend a lot on what style of video you want to make. When I first started out, I made a lot of videos with sped up footage showing how I do things, but I've changed that style now and shoot more specific scenes played much more slowly so that it's more enjoyable to watch and you can see what I'm doing more easily. Each little section in my video gets its own sequence in Premiere, then I nest those sequences together in the full length video. I start each editing session by importing all my footage, separating the clip into sequences, colour correcting, then cutting and splicing until I have the clip I want. Then I go into Procreate and I make all my titles, edit those into Premiere, then write a script and make all the music. You can edit your sound in your video editing program, but I use a door called Logic Pro on my Mac because I like it and I have a lot of control. I especially like that I can import a cut of my video into Logic and have it play as I record and mix. Making a video is a pretty long and involved process, but depending on the style of video you want to make, your mileage may vary. Some types of videos are simpler, and if you can afford it, you can outsource some of the work. I track all my time pretty specifically for each video because I like to know how long I spent working on things, so here's a rough breakdown. This video is about 17 minutes long, I spent an hour getting all my stuff together, then I spent two hours shooting half an hour of footage. The first edit took seven and a half hours. I spent 7 hours and 15 minutes making and animating my titles, then I spent about 3.5 hours writing this script and it will probably take me another hour to record it. I'll then spend a full day scoring and mixing my music and voiceover to the video, and after that I'll spend an hour and a half exporting the finished video, making a thumbnail, uploading to YouTube and sharing it on social media. All up, I'll have spent about 33 hours working on this video or more. You can definitely make videos much faster than I do, but before you start, it's good to know how long it can take. Moving on to more equipment, here are a few mic options for recording yourself. You can record into your phone or camera, but the audio quality from those won't be great. This little field recorder was the first mic I bought and I used it for a long time. You can use this as a microphone just on its own like this, or you can plug in a lapel mic and use it that way. And this is the recording with the lapel mic. So super easy. And especially good if you want to be moving around a lot. This is an old Rode NT2 mic that my husband has owned since the 1990s. I began using this to record voiceovers and vocals for music when I started recording into Logic. The screen behind it is made from acoustic foam and mounts onto the mic stand and it's a really great option if you can't sound treat your room. It stops the sound waves bouncing off your walls and back into your microphone, and will help make your recordings much clearer. 
You might remember seeing me at the start of this video recording into a different mic that didn't have this shield on it. It can be a pain to move around between mic stands, so I'm about to show you the DIY hack I use on the other mic that I record with. Yep, that's a duvet draped over my etching press with a bunch of cushions piled up behind the mic. Not the most elegant option, but it really does help. This mic also has a pop filter attached to it. You put this about 5cm from your mic so that it can catch and disperse plosive sounds like the letter P, which can distort your recording. In a normal recording situation, I'd stand about 30cm away from the pop shield to record my voiceover, and I set my mic stand at around the same height as my face. This microphone is my newest, and I highly recommend it. It's the Audio-Technica AT2020 mic. I use it for both vocals and voiceover work, and it's pretty inexpensive. Like the Rode, this is a condenser microphone, which means it's sensitive enough to pick up room sound and you can stand back from it to record. They tend to be better for a warm, natural sound, which is great for voice work. I have a regular style mic which needs an XLR cable to work. I recommend getting as good a quality mic stand as you can afford. It can be tempting to get a cheap mic stand, but cheap mic stands are cheap for a reason, and despite all the memes, you really don't want to drop a microphone. If you get a regular style mic like mine, you'll need an audio interface to connect it to your computer. Many mics also have a USB version these days, which will have a preamp and power built into the microphone. That might be the best option for you, and I've included links to both styles, but USB powered mics are much more expensive and have their drawbacks. An audio interface has a 48 volt button to supply power to your mic, and it also has the preamp inside that will convert the audio signal from your mic or your instrument into a format that your computer can understand. It's also good to have a pair of wired headphones to record and mix your sound with. If you try and record with wireless headphones like Bluetooth, you'll risk getting a lag in the recording, which can be really frustrating. One last bit of audio equipment that I recommend if you want to make your own music for your videos is a MIDI keyboard. You can use this with your door like Logic or GarageBand or Reaper to play music through any virtual instrument. This one that I have has some pads that can be used for drums as well, which are pretty fun. And that's how I make my videos. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe and share it. There are also links in the description for my website, my Patreon, my Facebook and my Instagram, and some affiliate links to art stores where you can buy materials. There are also affiliate links for Tommen and Europe where you can find a lot of the audio visual equipment that I showed you in this video. If you want me to make a more in-depth video on any aspect of this rundown, please let me know and I'll give it a shot. Thanks for watching. Cheers.